Okay, so Wednesday we we talked a lot about twins, and we sort of went through. We spent a lot of time going through the boring geometry of twins, right? And and the crystallography, uh, and um, we got a little bit into the properties and. And remember, I highlighted that this is a reciprocal of the work hardening rate. And so large slope means low work hardening. Flat slope means high uh, work hardening. And basically, we said that when twins first start to grow, they grow on slip in FCC at least. The 111 plane is both a twin system, the twinning plane and the slip plane. So when the first twins start to grow, they grow parallel to the slip direction. So it doesn't have much of an effect, right? There's not a lot of dislocations interacting with the, with the twins. But then once the system hardens enough and you start growing twins on other planes, they intersect. Then you have two things happening. You've got Hall Peck's-like effects because you've got smaller grains and pile-ups, right? And you also have more dislocation interactions because of uh, because of that. So when the intersect, when the twins start to intersect, you get very high hardening rates, and then you slow back down again when you get into dynamic recovery. Is the um, um, you you get a balance and you start removing dislocations, and then we talked about. Uh, Twin nucleation, and we talked about the pole mechanism, and uh, the mechanism from grain boundary dislocations uh, dissociating and forming twinning partials that then coalesce. The specific details of these are not important, because the fact is we don't know how twins nucleate. We are not likely to know exactly how twins nucleate. It's possible there's several competing mechanisms that, by which this can occur. And what's important here is that two big ideas is that we have an understanding of how we can actually form twins. Um, and that all of the mechanisms involve dislocations in some form. So the nucleation of the twin is actually appears to be dislocation mediated, right? It's not just a pure, a pure shear, right? The effect is a shear, but there's always uh, some sort of dislocation um, going on, right? And that's really the, the key idea. Okay, so we have the stages of of twinning. So first we have to nucleate the twins. And this is from uh, one of my papers I extracted it from. You can see, I believe that twins nucleate at the brain boundaries, right? Unlike a pole mechanism, which nucleates in the internal of the brain. So that's why I had twins, had it nucleating uh, there. But so first we need to nucleate the twins. And I say this is an uncertain time scale, right? There's some theories that say the nucleation event happens very quickly and then the nascent twin nuclei just sort of hang out on the, gra the grain boundaries until there's the right stress state and then they, they take off. Other say that nucleation happens sort of over uh, very quickly and then propagation happens. Um, so we really don't know uh, how fat, how long it takes to nucleate, but we know propagation, the growth of the twin across the grain happens very, very quickly, right? That's a nearly sort of instantaneous uh, thing. So in TEM studies, right, the fastest high-speed cameras we have on the microscope, they don't actually show twin propagation. Right. If you look at the movies, it's there's no twin, and then the next frame there's a 
thin twin lamella that's gone all the way across the grain. Right, so we can't actually capture the twin propagation event. It just happens too quickly. Um, then we have to uh, actually grow the twin. It has to it becomes right from a single, a couple atomic layers, depending on the system, grows into something that we can see on the light microscope. Right, and that. The time it takes for that to happen has to do with the um, two parameters. One is how fast is it deformation, is deforming. And then the second is going to be the stress required for nucleation. More specifically, the balance between the stress required for nucleation and the stress required for growth. Right? So if the twins can nucleate at very, very low stresses, right? We can also say that the the strength the, the stress to require growth also has to be low. Otherwise, we just nucleate a whole bunch of tiny little twins. But that's not what we see in deformation twinning. We see we see uh, tend to see thickening twins. Yeah. What is that a function of? The stress. The stress required to either grow or nucleate. It's very system dependent. And it's very either twin system. It's it's very material system dependent, and then different twins have different um, things. So it's it's you can think of it as analogous to um, slip system activity, right? So in VCC, you have multiple slip systems or possible, and in HCP, you've got basal, prismatic, and pyrimidal, right? And Perimeter tends to just be much harder to activate. You have a higher pyrrole stress, and it's it's analogous to that. It's just you've got different twin systems, different twin modes, um, and it's just how easy it is to move. I I think it's most easily related to the pyrrole stress to move the twinning partials, but some people still have pure shear uh, theories of how twins grow. You know, so there's still a lot of fundamental work that, that sort of needs to be needs to be done here. But we know sort of at a lower bound that the strength to grow a twin, the stress to grow a twin can't be lower than the stress to nucleate, because otherwise we just nucleate a whole bunch of really tiny twins and never and never grow them. On the other way around, right, if the stress to nucleate a twin is is very high, much higher than growth, which can potentially happen, we would then just very rapidly grow the twin um, after, it's, after it's formed. So, so we get a smaller number of much wider, much wider twins, right? And this tends to be what we see experimentally, right? Um, so if we take uh, um, uh, a thin bar of tin and magnesium, right, you can take it, if you just hold it up to your ear and bend it a little bit, you hear this rapid crackling sound. And that's actually when the twin propagates and then rapidly grows, it actually sets up shockwave, a shockwave internally in the material um, that you can hear. Right, so you can use acoustic emission to calculate a, a twinning, twinning rates. Um, and you can also see it in single crystal stress strain curves. So if you've got a single crystal and you're deforming, right, up into here, this is only slip, right? Then once we sort of reach the nucleation stress, we see a nucleation event and then we see a very rapid, quick drop in the stress level because now we're growing that twin. And that's much easier than either to the continued motion of the dislocations or uh, the growing of this twin. And all of a sudden, we run into this crazy serrated uh, um, increase and decrease in the uh, stress, the strain increments and the stress thing. Right. But it's actually. Uh, uh, really cool, right? If you ever come across uh, AZ31 or a lot of aluminum alloys, don't do it. But if you have some 
commercially pure aluminum, right? You can actually hear, I mean, commercially pure magnesium. Aluminum doesn't drink. You'll never hear, <laughs> you'll never hear acoustic emission from, from aluminum, but you will just, uh, hear it from, uh, pure magnesium. Yeah. I guess Alejandro and then say something. So you, the, the stress strain curve is a very straight there. Is that just uh, being sort of overly dramatic or is that like around the magnet? No, I mean, it can be. This is also a single crystal, okay. like perfectly aligned, ideal case test to show it. And even though it's a schematic, you do see some pretty dramatic oscillations. Yes. I just, you know, compared to other serrated phenomena, stress strain curve probably. Well, I mean, it doesn't happen. It's going to be dependent on, on the okay. system, right? And, and again, this happens. You won't see this in a polycrystal, right? Because the local behavior within a grain, right? This is a single crystal, so it's unconfined. The twins go right to the edges. They can grow parallel without, right? They, they right. You, ne you won't see this in a real stress strain curve. This is like a highly idealized loading sort of test. Okay. But um, okay, so we're sort of shifting just a little bit here. So this twinning shear, right? Remember, we've got a large amount of shear that is a, that is associated with. Um, the growth of this twin, right? So within the twin region, say in magnesium, we've got like a 12% shear associated with with tensile twins, right? That's pretty pretty large, right? And so that deformation has to be accommodated in the surrounding area. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask one question. It's not just the amount of strain, but also the strain Yeah. Oh God! So if you if you were to increase the strain rate, you would generally have higher stresses. You'd probably be nucleating more. I'd have to think about that. I mean, because it's a single crystal test, right? And so dynamically, with multiple phenomena happening at the same time, that's opening it can of worms and if I give you an answer I can almost guarantee it'll be wrong. So I don't I, I honestly don't know what would happen. But we can probably look for um, someone has to have done Hopkinson bar tests on single crystal magnesium. Right. So I'm sure people have done strain rates up to a thousand or so. Yeah, and, and then shock makes it even worse, right? Because now you've got uh, um, volumetric effects that you need to take into account. So, yeah. Okay, so we have to... Um, so that twin... That shear, right, in a polycrystal that, that we're confined by our neighbors, right? So you can think of the classic Eshelby uh, analysis, right? Remember, you probably did this in phase transformations with, um, with the seniors, right, where you take a, a region of one material, you cut out a circle and take it out, then you transform it so you get a volumetric change. Right, elastically compress it, put it back in the hole, and let it relax. Sort of this classic thought experiment on phase transformations, and looking at how the volumetric stress. Is this not the seniors are looking at me like I have, like I'm completely off my rocker. Okay. Well, anyway, so in mechanics, it's sort of this classical thought experiment, but don't worry about it. So in a twin, in the grain, we're forming this twin. Right, we've got all this confining stuff around it. The neighboring grains don't necessarily want to move. 
right? But we've got this sheared region, right? And that shear, the amount of the shear is significantly higher than the elastic strains of, um, of the neighbors. So, um, so the only, so a twin is going to initiate plastic deformation in the neighboring region, right, by slip, the existence of a twin, right? So a, a very thin twin, you might be able to accommodate elastically in the matrix surrounding, but as the twin grows, this accommodation is going to require slip, right? Or if you are near the surface, the accommodation is going to cause a kink. Depending on the twin systems, either can cause an internal or external kink. So you can imagine if this has got another grain here, right? You're forcing the other grain to accommodate that kink, right? That's another way of doing it, right? The grain, the grain, if the grain boundary doesn't move, this amount of plastic deformation, this amount of deformation has to be relieved by uh um, plastic deformation. And also twins, intersecting twins can lead to uh, fracture depending on the amount of shear, right? You may not be able to accommodate the mismatch, this large amount of shear locally, and you can lead to crack nucleation of the intersections, um, intersections of the twin. Okay, so that's some fundamental theory. I want to talk a little bit about some work on modeling twinning that I've done previously. And this is not uh, examinable, we'll say, right? So it's, I'm sort of presenting this just because it's, it's uh, relevant, but it's not something I'm going to be, be asking on because other than going to read my papers, you're not going to find any information on it. I'm excited if you do that, but I'm not going to, to test you on it. So, um, how do we go about modeling twinning in polycrystals? Right? It seems to be sort of a, a difficult, a difficult area. And I spent a lot of time when I was at Los Alamos. This was one of the primary things that. Uh, that I worked on, and we, uh, my colleagues and I, we came up with this notion that that twin twin nucleation depends on both material and mechanical parameters. You have to have. We did grain boundary. We thought about grain boundary nucleation of twins, and we said you have to have the right grain boundary structure. Right, not all grain boundaries are equivalent. Right, so not every grain boundary is going to be the same with respect to its propensity to twin, right? Some grain boundaries will twin much easier than other grain boundaries. And then you have to have the right stress state at that grain boundary, right? And that stress state is caused by a dislocation pileup, right? Which happens at a length scale that's so much smaller than our modeling that we're doing, right? If we're modeling a polycrystal, I can't follow individual defects, right? I, it's just not, it's not possible to do. So a lot of uh, plasticity models like this mean field viscoplastic self-existent model, which the seniors will be doing starting in mod sim and using in two weeks. Um, it doesn't have any of these sort of microstructural details. It just has a texture, right? You think of grains as these uh, sort of regions of a crystal in an, in an embedded infected medium. And that'll make more sense in a couple of weeks. So how, how we, we need to sort of incorporate these lower lane scales in a stochastic or probabilistic manner, right? So, Things that are deterministic at very low length scales. If you don't have access to those details, they, assume, they assume, can seem random, 
right? So if you uh, think about um, if you if you're looking at the city of Columbus, right, and you look at uh, population, right, you can't see individual people, but what I can measure is the number of people per a city block, right? I have a population density that's spatially resolved, right? What do you think game day is going to look like? All of a sudden, you have a fairly a population density that's pretty stable. And then all of a sudden, you have 100,000 people in one square block, right? That's has a personal, a perfectly rational explanation from, you know, some level of understanding. But if you're looking at it up above without understanding the details and just counting number of people, that makes absolutely no sense, right? And in many ways, modeling micro uh, things that depend on the atomistic scale from the macro scale appears exactly the same way. There's things going on that make sense from an atomistic perspective that make no sense from a, uh, a, a top-down point of view. So we have to include like things like stochastic information. The details of that we won't I won't get into because what I want to to show are some uh, experimental details and some results. So in hexagonal metals. We have extreme anisotropy, um, right? So if we have a rolled and recrystallized plate, we have a plate where we have most of the grains where the C-axis is aligned with the through thickness of the plate, right? That's just the natural texture that evolves from thermal mechanical processing uh, um, in this. And so you can imagine if we compress it in the through thickness direction versus compressing in plane, where we're pressing on the C axis versus compressing on the A axis of the crystal, we can get very different uh, different response. And, and we can see that. If you look at the stress strain curves for these different systems, they're 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 drastically it's drastically different, right? This is the same material uh, deformed under the same conditions. This happens to be liquid nitrogen temperature and pure zirconium. But you can see the amount of anisotropy uh, that we get. Experimentally, this system is is pretty pretty weird in that if we look um, from an EBSD analysis, so that's our initial grain structure up here. We can see most of the grains are red, indicating that that C-axis is normal. And then we deform it, right? We see our twinned structure. Uh, virtually every grain uh, has twin, so we've got a major microstructure. Uh, alteration that happens and in a lot of the grains we see multiple twin systems occurring and in and uh, if you do the statistics if you go through and look at what you see if we just look at our macroscopic loading right we say we're going to load this orthogonal to this plane in compression so if we assume that that's the stress state in every grain, and we calculate the Schmidt factors for the different twin systems, we see that most of the twins that form have high Schmidt factors, right? That's expected, right? So the, the twins that form are well aligned, right? But we also see a lot of twins a non-statistically insignificant number of twins that have very low Schmidt factors, right? These are twins that we wouldn't expect to see form given the macroscopic loading, right? And we can go through and look at if we rank the twin systems, 
the first variant, the one that's most likely to form, the second that's right, most roughly eighty uh, percent, seventy-five percent of the twins that form are the highest or second highest Schmidt factor, have the highest or second highest Schmidt factor in the brains. But that means the full 25% of the twins that form, the, the highest Schmidt factor isn't growing, but a lower, a twin with a lower Schmidt factor in the brain is. Yeah. But wouldn't the variants have a specific Schmidt factor relative to orientation? Yeah, that's what this is showing. So it's saying if I look at, if I, if I go grain by grain yeah. and I calculate the Schmidt factor for each twin system, right? And then I look at what twins are actually there, right? Then you'll see that a lot of the twins that actually have form are not the ones that would be predicted by a Schmidt analysis, right? There are other variants, right? That's the point, the point that we're making. And the analysis of it, the seniors that were in mod sim, this is exactly the same analysis that was done with the magnesium twin, right? Thank you. Everyone had that hor horrible experience with, right, for the for that particular question. Um, so what's so how you know what's going on with these twins here? It basically says that when it comes to twinning, the local stress state is what governs everything, right? That shouldn't be a surprise, right? You've got a heterogeneous system, right? The stress is not going to be uniform. Every grain is not going to have a perfectly, uh, a stress state that's perfectly aligned, right? There's, there's going to be significant um, uh, heterogeneity, and we want to try and capture that, that in the model. Um, and... What I want to show is how dramatic the texture uh, is. So here we started out with uh, perfectly near near perfect basal texture. All of our grains have their c-axis aligned with the plate, and as we deform, right, we get a uh, tensile twin systems which reorient our grain roughly 90 degrees to the c-axis so after at low temperatures where we have huge amounts of twinning virtually all of our c-axes are now pointing in the in the plane of the plate whereas they were all pointing were all pointing up before right and at higher temperatures where we don't have nearly as much twinning we have prismatic slip and c plus a pyramidal slip and our c axes rotate they split and they rotate to stable orientations but they don't go 90 degrees right so we by looking at the texture of our crystal we can uh Get a lot of information about what um, what systems are are actually active, right? And we can see a uh, very large difference in the volume fraction of the twins as a function of temperature for a given for a given strain. Right, and so this is something. Th these evolution plots like this are something we really need modeling for, because we can't do a hundred interrupted tests at various temperatures to count the number of twins that we that we see. But if we have a model that does a good job of predicting that these square dots are, are the experimental data points, right? Then we can begin to look at what's happening um, internally. Okay, well, so the top, this is experimentally measured textures. These are the ones predicted from the model, right? But 
the model results are not. Right. Well, I mean, from a modeling point of view, from this is not a big difference, right? Yeah. No, I I would classify this as pretty dang good agreement. Um, and but you know the intensities um, are slightly are slightly less. It's cut off. This is four point four versus four point two times random, but typically. Um, Models, crystal plasticity models tend to over predict the rate of texture evolution, right? Relative to experiments. Um, that's just sort of a general, a general trend. Um, but really, the model results are not sort of what I want to point out here. It's really just the physical phenomenon of what's happening within this, po this polycrystalline sample, right? How dramatic the effects of twinning can be um, and that's we see that in the stress strain curve right this is the region we can sort of break this into uh, the region so here we have basically um, at five percent we look at the volume correlate this with the volume fraction of twins here we're basically in the slip dominated regime right here we start to see twinning, and then here we have the inter we're in the intersecting twin regime. So you get this, right? And we also have the lattice reorientation. So we have this con convex up region of the stress strain curve where we normally think the stress strain curve is sort of monotonically increasing and being concave down the whole time, right? So Twinning gives you, deformation twinning can give you interesting effects in the stress strain curve. And then this is sort of an experiment that we did. The motivation for this is that we think of, we don't have a good understanding of the whole strain rate and temperature space, right? We do experiments at a constant strain rate and vary the temperature. Then we do experiments at a constant temperature and vary the strain rate. But in reality, so we're really just exploring the two axes of this strain rate temperature plane, right? There's not a lot of data in the middle, right? And so we wanted to look at that with respect to twinning. So what we did is we came up with this, um, uh, way of doing, uh, Hopkinson bar testing where we arrest the deformation at a certain level, right? We don't just smash it completely flat. So what we do is we put this really high hard donut around the sample, right? That's got a hole that's wide enough so it won't interfere with the expansion of our sample. But when the bar hits it, it basically stops. And then you just have some inertial effects. And what we what we did is we did quasi-static at, at liquid nitrogen temperature, and then we did high rate at room temperature, and the idea was to get the same stress strain curves, right? Adjust the strain rate so we got the same curve at both room temperature and liquid nitrogen. Um, and try and tease out the rate and um, temperature dependence. And we saw something really interesting, and that is that in both cases, we had the same number of twins, right? But they were much thicker in the, uh, the average twin thickness is much higher in the high rate. So that means that, that nucleation one can happen at those very high rates, right? And two, that the the rate of the the rate of nucleation is a function of strain is in, appears to be independent of the temperature and the strain rate, right? 
So since we have the same number of twins under two drastic, lo drastically different loading conditions that follow the same stress strain curve, right? We have uh, suggest that twin nucleation is is not a rate or temperature dependent phenomenon. We also saw basically, oh, the axes of these are a little hard to read. The, the number of twins per grain looks very similar between both samples. And the number of twin variants observed per grain, those statistical distributions look very similar. But the overall volume fraction was higher. Right? So growth has a strong temperature dependence. Nucleation appears to, growth has a, a, a very strong temperature and rate dependence, whereas nucleation appears to appears to, to not. Of course, that's just one experiment right, that I feel kind of strongly about because I did it. Right? It's one of the very few experiments I've actually done. So keep keep that with a, take that with a grain of salt. So that that wraps up uh, 20. Right. And now we get to go on to Martin's site. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. So okay. So remember, twinning and Martin site they appear to be very different, but have much in common. The Martin site reacts. The twinning doesn't change the uh, crystal structure or the phase. The Martin site reaction is a phase transformation, right? But it's uh, uh, a shear transformation, very much in the same way that a twin that the twin transformation is. The driving force for Martin site most of the time is uh, a change in the free energy, right? It's a thermal, thermally driven process rather than a deformation driven process. There is strain induced Martin site that we'll talk about, but for the most part, when it comes to steels, we're talking about, uh, at least plain carbon steels, we're talking about the thermal, um, Uh, the thermal effects, right? And so this is uh, just the comparison, military versus civilian transformation. And as just sort of a refresher, remember Martin's site, it basically cuts off our TTT diagram at the bottom, right? At high temperatures, we form perlite. At lower temperatures, we go lower down, we form Vidman statin ferrite. Go down a little bit more, we'll form bainite. And then if we come down here, we hit Martin site, right? And why are these lines flat? Right? Why all of a sudden does it go this? We have a C curve and then flat lines, horizontal lines out. It's not time dependent, right? It's going to happen instantaneously nearly instantaneously on cooling, right? So as we go down, we hit the Martin site start. And then as we keep cooling, we'll eventually hit the Martin site, Martin site finish where we're completely Martin site. And it's not gonna matter how fast we cool through this region, right? It's gonna be basically occurs at the, uh, at that temperature, right? And so, Martin site in and of itself has structure. Um, it forms into uh, laths, right? And then there's sub blocks between sub, these, what we call sub block boundaries between the laths, right? And so we'll, we'll talk more about the definitions of these, but. Uh, We have what we call packets blocks, subblocks, and the individual laps. Sort of like in Bainite, how we had sheets and everything in the sheet was similar crystallographic orientation. 
basically everything in the block is going to be in a similar crystallographic orientation, right? Um, and we'll we'll talk more about that structure uh, as we go on. Okay, so <coughs> as we lower the temperature, if we're in a, a system that's capable of the Martensitic reaction, we go through a equilibrium temperature, right? That's going to separate the uh, the stability ranges of the two systems, right? And, and basically, this is just to remind you that it, it obeys sort of the classical thermodynamics of any other phase transformation, right? We're going to be the phase that this is temperature. So as we cool, right? We're at austenite because that's lower free energy. Once we hit the martensite start temperature, or the equilibrium temperature, sorry, right? We now have uh, the Austin, the the martensite, the alpha prime phase is lower free energy, and once that undercooling is sufficient to trigger motion, right, to give us enough driving force to trigger the motion, we're going to transform to the uh, the austenite, so this is at a constant carbon content, right? Right. This is the free energy diagram at constant uh, carbon. If we look at the free energy diagram for constant temperature with the varying carbon content, right, we can see the uh, right the austenite and our martensite and a good old common tangent construction. So basically. The thermodynamics of Martin site formation is the same, right, as a diffusional transformation, but the kinetics and mechanisms are quite different, right? So we can still predict where Martin site, when Martin site is going to, to start. And so these are all sorts of systems that go through uh, um, Martin Cytic transformations. So up here, uh, titanium nickel, right? This is uh, shape memory alloys up top. We have steels and iron platinum, which is a, a bit of an odd one. But so if we look at the driving force for martensite formation in steel and in iron nickel, right? It's huge compared to other sort of uh, quintessential martensite forming systems, right? So the forming martensite and shape memory alloys, right? The, the uh, change in free energy is an order uh, more than an order of magnitude less than the driving force for martensite. It gives free energy associated with martensite transformation um, in steel, right? So there's there's virtually no way, right? The driving force is so large, right? If you haven't exhausted your other mechanisms before you get to the Martin site start temperature, right? You haven't transformed into ferrite by some other way. It's very difficult to avoid the um, Martin Civic transformation in uh, plain carbon steels. So now um, so we're going to get into a little bit of or, or setting up getting into the boring crystallography of one site. Right. And so we have, uh, if remember for twinning, we define something we call the twinning plane, right, which is an undistorted plane in all directions, right? So the atoms on the twin plane are unchanged with respect to their positions, and um, all vectors in the twin plane on undergoing the twinning transformation, their magnitudes don't change, and the angles between those vectors don't change. Right? In Martin's site, we also have um, a plane that remains undistorted in the same way, and that is termed the uh, the habit plane, right? And but unlike in 
twinning where it's a pure shear, in Martin's site, we both have a shear component and a tensile component orthogonal to that, to that plane. Right? So we have a shear in the plane. We have a tensile component that's orthogonal to the plane. And if you think about it, neither, if we do it the right way, neither one of those is going to change those angles, right? I'm talking about two angles or two vectors in the plane, and I pull orthogonal to that plane. I'm not doing anything to the angle or the length of these vectors, right? And if I shear, I need to find the right shear so that doesn't so that doesn't happen. Right, and so in general, this is what we call an invariant, a more formal definition of invariant plane strain. When we talked about Martin's side, I sort of invoked the concept, but I didn't really define it, um, define it very, very formally. I just talked about it being a, uh, um, a shear. And so if we look at the different steels, we see that the um, habit planes uh, change. We'll see this um, dramatically, or we'll see a lot of examples about of, of this, right? But also the shears associated with this are quite large, right? We got like 20% shear and 9% uh, uh, normal component, tensile component, right? So that's a huge amount of strain associated with this Martin City transformation, right? We're on the order of like 30% overall strain associated with the formation of Martin site. Um, also notice that in general, when we're talking about steels, we're going from austenite FCC to the body centered tetragonal phase. Other systems, iron nickel goes FCC to BCC. Titanium also exhibits a Martin Siddick transformation where it goes from the BCC beta phase to HCP alpha. Right? We'll talk about that. Right? Usually that's a, a um, diffusional transformation, but if you cool it fast enough, you can force it to go Martin Siddick as well. Um, and other systems, but for steel, we're concerned with the austenite to body centered tetragonal um, transformation. Yeah, you had your hand up, Jason? Yeah. Um, so, not very familiar with the Martin City transformation. Other materials other than um, iron and So, what, what's the you know, uh, definition of going from? It's, it's not, it's not referring to a, a phase, right? It's just a, any phase transformation that's a big thermal. Is that a yeah, so I guess for a working definition, and like any good working definition, there's exceptions, right? So we'll talk about Martin's site as a athermal shear transformation, a diffusionless uh, athermal transformation. Right, and then I'm going to break that because on Monday we'll I'll show an example of how Martin site even in some in some systems like iron nickel can have a a thermal and an isothermal uh, component to it as well. But I think that'll be a, um, a reasonable working definition of what we call a, a Martin Siddic transformation. Okay. So because the, the shape deformation is primarily shear, right? The shear is a larger component. The Martin site plates deform the lattice very much like twins deform the lattice. And we get these lenticular uh, Martin site plates. And remember the, the, in a single crystal, we get parallel twins and parallel Martin site plates that extend across the entire region, right? They go from end of the crystal to end of the crystal. And the walls of the Martin Cynic region are parallel to the habit plane. 
But when we have to confine, when we're confined, the uh, we take on the lenticular shape because this is the shape that minimizes the elastic, the strain energy, right? This minimizes the amount of accommodation that we need to do by plastic deformation in the region surrounding. Uh, surrounding, and that we get these steps, right? If you have a martensitic, martensite lath that grows into the surface, we get uh, deformation on the surface that's characteristic of the, the shear transformation, right? So we'll get kinking on the surface um, 